Hey everyone, I'm introducing my uh, new updated and revised breastfeeding course as long promised. So I've called it Life Sucks. <laughs> Uh, because if you don't get a good suck to begin with, then really life does suck in a number of different ways. So I'm going to be reviewing a whole host of things in this um, uh, course, but also in this little introductory uh, video. So in a minute, you'll get some free CPD. So you've got a bunch of uh, slides I'll just talk through, A, to introduce the course, and then B, just to get you oriented uh, anyway. But if you want to buy the course, uh, then what you need to do is to go along to the Osteo Bite Size Dot com website. So this is a new course website, so it should be much easier to find what it is that you want. You go to browse and buy courses and you've got a whole host of things to um, choose from there. And when you click on to that, you'll get a, a variety of um, course products come up. So there's going to be a bunch of categories. So all these little bits um, uh, which have red writing, they're a category. So you can see that some categories have one, some categories have six or two or three um, courses within them or five. Uh, and then if you keep scrolling, you simply get to everything uh, individually anyway with a, over a variety of pages. Uh, and obviously what we want to be able to do is to go to the pediatrics, including the primitive and um, uh, reflexes course that course is coming very shortly uh, and um, breastfeeding so you can simply click on that uh, and then get a, a, an overview of all of the products uh, in this uh, dynamic so we've got a bunch of breastfeeding things which obviously you can sort of click onto there or scroll down so that gives you an idea of where you can actually buy it and if you're after the actual taught certificate program which is assessed so um if you want to further your postgraduate education, uh, then what you want to do is to come along and browse the cnmo.co.uk. So cnmo.co.uk, and that's for if you want to take the um, uh, certificate version, which is um, doubles up uh, at least on all of the information and that you get in each individual CPD series, plus gives you some assessments, plus gives you Zoom time uh, with me and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, what am I going to cover in this breastfeeding um, program? So as we know, um, breastfeeding is something that osteopaths, um, I'm sure, have always had an, an interest in, but has definitely the um, um, professional focus on um, osteopathic approach to lactation support, mother infant dyad support, uh, you know, uh, and all of those associated generics, that's definitely uh, becoming a much more um, uh, vibrant um, field of care within the osteopathic professional scope. But obviously, this is quite a specialised area. A standard paediatrics course may give you some ideas, but isn't necessarily going to cover all aspects of what you might need to be aware of. And in the course, what I do is I try to uh, highlight issues which um, need to be shared knowledge, skills and attitudes across all professionals um, and um, healthcare workers um, working with um, these mums and their babies. Uh, so what we want to be able to do is to understand, OK, how big is this field of science? It's big. What is it based on? There's a huge amount of research. Uh, which bits of that can osteopaths capture? Well, you can capture most of it in some degree. Are there some papers which mention osteopathy and research together with breastfeeding, etc.? Uh, yes. So there's definitely some emergent stuff, uh, but the stuff that's relevant to us is going to also be coming from outside other body workers, other hands-on care professional practitioners, craniosacral therapists, and so on. Uh, they are also accumulating a, an enormous body of work. And with our dynamics of structure and function being so interrelated with our understanding of the autonomics, uh, with our gentle touch based uh, dynamics, so whether you do involuntary mechanism stuff, whether you do biodynamic, whether you do um, energetic or whether you do, uh, you know, gentle, um, um, if you like, a, a baby version of sort of direct gentle techniques and stretching and unwinding and so on, um, then it doesn't matter because it's an approach that we can all come together on. Uh, we can all share this same underlying um, body of work. Uh, and get a really good um, contributory framework um, and, and that will help us understand where it is that we fit in in the grand scheme of things. As some of you will know, I've been uh, advocating for quite a while for some additional form of um, recognition, sort of um, uh, somewhat of a specialist credentialing. And I'm absolutely aware that everybody hates that and runs screaming as soon as, um, you know, uh, credentialing and judgment is called into play. But really, in order to inform other people, other patients, uh, the rest of the healthcare community uh, is to inform them of where we're at with our understanding, we need to be able to illustrate that. And our general 
level undergraduate programmes don't provide the foundation um, sufficiently for us working in these more advanced fields of care. And if we want to promote our dynamic and our potential contributions, then we actually have to be able to illustrate um, how we are working in the uh, dynamics of the uh, range of healthcare services, uh, the range of evidences and where we fit in. You know, why would one want to contribute uh, to consult an osteopath or similar practitioner? What is it that that person's going to gain from coming to see us? And where do we fit in? So this whole dynamic of roles, boundaries, who does what, you know, where does it transfer over? You know, what are the overlaps? You know, what's our unique contribution? All of these things I'm hoping to, to um, draw out. Uh, so you're going to get a, a, a hint of those sorts of things. So uh, let's let's carry on. So. Life Sucks, the supporting infant feeding series. Uh, it's, it's not the last word on the subject, uh, but it sure is gonna give you an awful lot of information. So we're going to be discussing a range of things to do with breastfeeding and um, infant feeding support um, uh, 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 for osteopaths in the main, but similar professions will be um, of, uh, find this of interest. So we're looking at a whole range of mother and infant dynamics. And obviously, so much of how the baby, if you like, emerges, how much of how mum can interact with the baby as soon as um, uh, birth has occurred. So whatever your birth modality, um, as soon as the two of you come together to try to initiate feeding, there's already a whole host of um, experiences that the two of you have shared. And these experiences are fundamentally important to appreciate. So even if you can't wind back the clock <laughs> and do it differently, you're then going to be able to understand the impact that this is having uh, on their ongoing relationship and their ongoing mutual functionality, um, etc. So it's absolutely an issue of space. And we talk all sorts of things about optimum fetal positioning and the sensory experiencing of the uh, infant. And we look at all of these, sort of, if you like, the visceral bounds and the movement dynamics. I spend a long time focusing on uh, intrauterine fetal movements, uh, the dynamics of the fetal space, the impact that, that has on the whole emergent um, uh, um, neural apparatus of the infant. So the sensory um, components in their neural networks, how those are being um, stimulated, that absolutely is established well within the pregnancy uh, dynamic. And it gives you an understanding of how um, a, a range of things can um, emerge uh, on birth. So it helps us also to appreciate how intrauterine moulding, but also intrauterine movement experiencing, intrauterine stimulation of the vestibular system and sound dynamics. All of this affects both the um, uh, infant um, developing uh, dynamics, but also the maternal scenario. And then as we actually, so we go through a whole host of things like that, and we set up a story uh, about primitive reflexes. So in, in the whole of this program, I can't, you know, give you the entire primitive reflex story because, again, that's huge. Um, but obviously we are definitely going to be going through some primitive reflexes. But I do deal with this enormous topic in that new revised primitive reflexes, neurodevelopment and neurodiversity course that you can find uh, on Osteobite Size. So we go through then the process of birth. So, you know, what should happen? What should contribute? Why is it important to have a type of birth? Uh, what does the infant gain? Uh, and, and how does that set them up? So we certainly go through a whole dynamic of, you know, normal birth movements. <clears throat> what should be happening with the reflexive nature of the birthing between mother and infant? which reflex are you supposed to use when and, and et cetera. And we talk about, you know, brainstem ticking off experiences. Say, oh yes, that's good. That fits my template. Yep, I'm happy with that. And it goes through a variety of uh, dynamics. We also um, go through a variety of issues to do with uh, birth molding uh, and then um, stresses and strains within. We look at a whole number of issues of um, how the head fits, how the body fits, you know, how you birth a whole baby not just the head, obviously, uh, and how the sort of uh, um, dynamics of blaming everything on the birth uh, might not in fact be appropriate because the birth might in fact rescue a few factors for you, not necessarily compound a few. Um, so it, it's really appreciating the infant cranium, the dynamic aspects. We look at uh, cerebrospinal fluid dynamics. We look at sort of venous um, issues. We look at how brain functionality, your infratentorial space, even sort of, you know, arterial supply, uh, uh, we touch upon and so we set up how the um, infant um, physicality is compressed but we immediately start talking throughout all of this on um, neural receptors 
you know, trigeminal, or we have som somatic cervical, we have um, all sorts of things to do with vestibular and vagal and um, et cetera dynamics. So there's a, a massive amount of appreciating that this anatomy, it, when we touch it, we might think structure and, and anatomical fascial planes and so on, but the body is more thinking neurological receptor fields. It's talking um, neural networks from neural reflexes, uh, contributory um, convergent signals, but also divergent signals into other areas of the cortex. So really, when it comes to understanding suck, swallow, breathe, you really have to appreciate a, 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 the huge in-depth dynamics of this neural communication, which the infant's trying to build. It can only build so much before it's born, uh, and then it continues to build it thereafter. And we'll speak more of that in a moment. But so when we're talking, it's respect, receptor speak, not just fascial speak. And, that, and that's a critically important that you, you take that on board. And obviously we go through a whole host of things to do with how you can test primitive reflexes to help you understand um, not only the dynamics of are they ready to feed, so have they got all the oral reflexes and so on, um, but also the issues of um, has there been any birth related neurological damage which can be demonstrated through changed um, responsiveness in or changed expression of the infant primitive reflexes. And we talk also about all the myriad uh, dynamics, so how do craniums and bodies and nerves and blood vessels and all of this, how does it become stressed and strained, what's the myofascial responsiveness to all of this um, and how is that going to compromise uh, this patterning of suck swallow breathe and how is it going to impact on the um, uh, reflexogenic nature and ability of the infant to get on with its uh, uh, its pre-programmed events and, and settle into that suck swallow breathe and so we talk a lot about the sensory experiencing of actually emerging um, and then having to have the right signals, the right signals go in, the right experiences happen, then the right motor programming can be reinforced. Um, and so the whole thing should be a cascade of positive reinforcement, positive increasing um, capability uh, in a safe and non-emotionally threatening and pain-free uh, dynamic. So yes, so we, we continue our story about reflexes, but we continue it in the context of this neurodevelopmental uh, dynamic through various different parts of the brain so we are going to talk brain anatomy i'm afraid so uh, you know scrub those brain cells off and uh, um when we are when you're in the course page and you'll find so i've got a, at least 15 different lecture modules and this would be an example of one of them so this is going to be sort of hours of of uh, lectures if you like so several days worth of if you were to sit and attend a practical lecture all day every day you know you've got uh, uh, several weekends there plus lots of resources I've drawn from the internet, lots of um, papers that I've found, uh, links to articles, um, research uh, things that you can download, uh, and then helping you to understand uh, through the use of sort of videos that we point you to, um, all sorts of different dynamics about this whole um, story of this aspect of the infant's life and the infant's life with its mum. So uh, we, we definitely go through all that because there's no point, I think, um, understanding um, or having some handholds having some anatomy of where your tensivini palatini is, having some um, sort of pictures which help you to appreciate that this is your technique, uh, even some video demonstrations of technique, etc. There's no good you just having the, if you like, the mechanics of action in your head. You've actually got to have an appreciation of how and why those things are relevant. What is it that you're aiming to do? And what are you supposed to be working through? Are you working through circulatory channels? Are you working through neural reflexes and networks? Are you working on mechanical fascial um, uh, dynamics? Are you looking at mechanoreceptors and, and so on? <clears throat> Where's the overlap between all these signalings, neural barriers, chemical barriers on fluidic and mechanical barriers to good effective function? So your technique, you know, having it described is one thing, uh, but having the appreciation behind it helps you appreciate appreciate your contribution and what it is that you're trying to um, work with in terms of the um, functional pathophysiology of the dynamics that the infant and mum are suffering with. So I'm really um, uh, concerned that you get um, uh, this underlying awareness because otherwise you're flying blind, you aren't going to be able to determine whom you can help, in what way you can help them, what's the limits on that help, whom else do they need to be referred to, what other healthcare providers would be better placed than you for example, can you do concurrent care or supplementary care, you know, where, where does your screening and diagnostic abilities sort of run out if you like, and how are you then going to um, con uh, communicate what you're doing with other 
parties and so it's no good resorting to osteopathic speak of you know whatever uh, you actually have to be able to frame it in in terms and um uh, scientific analogies that others a are working with and b can understand so they can fit in with you you can fit in with them and so on so this appreciation of, of this uh, of, of the underlying um evidence base is is, is critical So we start our journey, we understand birth and we understand then what's supposed to happen afterwards. So the dynamics of the breast crawl, which reflexes you're using, you know, what, what's um, going to be um, driving the infant to do all these things. And we look at what may be compromising things. And I've got um, uh, some, some few things to sort of add in onto some typical reflexes, which are supposed to impact on uh, this dynamic, such as the um, asymmetric tonic neck reflex. So I'll be going through some interesting uh, control as to whether you do or don't have one when you are actually born. When does it really emerge? When does it kick off and get going? And what's its purpose for? Um, and how does it interfere? So yeah, we're going to go through a bit of that. So we have to understand suck, swallow, breathe. So yes, there's the things that the tongue does, then there's the vacuuming, there's the seal, there's the uh, uh, action of the pharynx and the pharyngeal muscle, the soft palate, the uval actions, the uh, anatomy of the pharyngeal constrictors, the, uh, as I said, the glossopalatus, the uh, tensivini palatini, we go through a whole bunch of anatomy. We also give you concepts of how the infant anatomy and its alignments, arrangements, um, tensionality and so on, then has to change as you get into the more adult, you know, older child and adult dynamic. And so the changing angles, the different space things that you need to be aware of so that when you put your hands on, you know, there's differences to what you might have been ex um, uh, a more practiced with with um, older children or adults. So we go through the mechanics of the suck, we go through tongue dynamics, what's it supposed to do? Uh, and we go through what's happening with where swallow is, you know, uh, there's the tongue bit and then there's the soft palate bit and then there's the pharyngeal uh, phase getting into the esophagus and then, you know, in fact, all the way down to the stomach and beyond. Um, and then there's um, uh, issues of um, airflow. You've got to fit your breathing in in between your swallowing because it's pretty tricky to do both. And you want to have safety and survival mechanisms built in. So we go through a whole bunch of that and so when um, infants in utero, they can practice swallow, but they can't practice air breathing. So they can't practice maintaining their own oxygen levels on demand. And obviously any muscular effort, even a swallow is a, is a, is a demand metabolically uh, for the infant. And so it's, of course, just had all of this complex transition physiology of all of the heart changes and of the foraminal changes um, within the vasculature and so on. And so its circulatory patterning is completely novel to it in terms of managing it for itself. So this is a huge um, thing. So we look at a lot of the neurology uh, of that uh, and we look to try to understand how the infant maintains its own, for example, oxygen saturations and so on. So in this uh, aspect of the lectures, we then ask, you know, things like, um, are your lungs more important to manage in the suck, swallow, breathe equation than the sphenoid, for example? I know people are annoyed about me going on about, you know, it's not all to do with the sphenoid and so on. And uh, they can get a bit sort of, uh, you know, saying, come on, Caroline. <laughs> but uh, I'm only making reference to things like that with respect to the fact that there are other um, components, other organs, other neural networks, which are critically important when you're actually trying to understand what's um, interfering with efficient suck, swallow, breathe. Why can some babies do it and others not? So what is it about the others that can't manage it so effectively? What is it about them that we might be able to interact with to bring them into a greater efficiency? That's the whole point, really. So you've got to look beyond what you might traditionally feel could be the typical osteopathic places of contact and, and, and dynamics for work. So we look at a whole host of complex things to do with the um, suck um, uh, center, regulatory center. We look at respiratory regulatory centers. We look at how the fact that all sorts of things like sucking are a rhythmicity. There's a there's a, a, a dynamic to it. And so hopefully the infant's doing it smoothly. So breathing is another um, uh, rhythm. Um, we, we look at all sorts of things as to how does an infant experience rhythmicity and get itself set up. And so we go through all sorts of things to do with the vestibular system, which you might never have thought of, um, and, and the emergent dynamics as to which sensory dynamic, which autonomic nervous system links in the brain, which networks are built first, because if they're built first, 
They're built first for a reason and other things come later on the foundation of these earlier things. So we go through um, all of that. So we have to then think of if you're trying to build up suck, then you're trying to build up interruption of suck to breathe. And then you're trying to build up interruption of breathe to suck and then swallow. Then you've got all sorts of things to do with the diaphragm, the respiratory rib cage. You've got to do then cardiorespiratory. So now we've got sort of heart and blood vessel dynamics. We've got carotid baroreceptors and aortic arch things. We've got ventral fascias. We've got mediastinal fascias. We've got that diaphragmatic dynamic and we've got the somatic innovated diaphragm, the phrenically innovated diaphragm, the vagal innovated diaphragm. We've got the stomach and lower esophageal sphincter and all sorts. But we have these uh, dynamics of control, these central pattern generators, which enable us to do rhythmic actions uh, smoothly and carefully. And if you just take one tiny look at this particular um, image, you can see that the central pattern generator, which is neatly fitted with in between um, your sort of, um, uh, if you want polyvagal speak, your dorsal vagal and your ventral vagal components, or if you want sort of general neuroanatomy speak, it's these central pattern generators sit between input of the nucleus tractor solitarius and the nucleus ambiguous, which then has an effector drive through onto the um, oropharynx, the motor dynamics. It has an afferent sensory dynamic through, uses many cranial nerves and it helps, he has this voluntary component and feedback network back into cortex, but you then have this emotional limbic, you have this extra pyramidal system, and I'm going to bring in the extra pyramidal system quite a lot um, with our understanding of, of, of what makes central pattern generators inefficient, what stops them emerging as really good efficient um, things, because you need these, you need these patternings, these rhythmicities for a whole host of things. So we look at all sorts of things to do with whether, you know, your spontaneous swallow or your reflexive swallow is good and so on. And we build in aspects of how um, motor tone asymmetries, how vestibular influences um, all can um, uh, bring conflict into this and how much of this um, uh, asymmetry which then impacts on the whole cascade of events that we've been talking about and the, then the central pattern generators setting up your suck center and your respiratory center and so on such that you can coordinate things we then look at how uh, many of these things are started out in utero and it's not the birth that sort that, that creates issues it's prior to birth and those prior birth intrauterine dynamics which are carried on so we talk a lot about that and then we talk a lot about, of course, any other sorts of um, uh, circadian or biological uh, oscillators. We look at sleep. We look at how the baby can go down into sleep. We look at this issue of arousal. Now, it, it, arousal is a very complex thing. It, look, it, it has to do with all sorts of infant behaviourings. And we see how we can then um, uh, uh, dynamise an entire physiological metabolic understanding of this issue of, are you awake enough to feed? Um, are you aroused enough to use a digestive? Track in order to manage uh, metabolically and nutrit nutritionally what it is that you've just swallowed, even if you manage to swallow it. Uh, and then how is that going to then impact on your self-regulatory uh, behaviourings, your, your ability to self-soothe, your ability to sleep, get good sleep, get restorative sleep and so on, without that sleep being disturbed and then the impact that that sleep has on your um, central nervous systems and we so we go through all sorts of things to do with that and then we we talk about movement and arousals we look at how the infant body can use itself can it have enough motor tone and action can it have enough blood pressure to manage you know dynamics of suck swallow breathe and and so on and so we have to understand all sorts of subcortical and brainstem reflexes and cortical interactions and so on which will help us understand what's actually going on what's the infant trying to do what are the safety valves in built into this and how we can work with those um you know osteopathically or with any form of sort of hands-on care so we, we talk a lot about these uh dynamics so yeah may sound complicated but actually if you just break it down in bits and pieces it's really not that dramatically horrifying and so we're going to try and sort of just go through that gently with you and you're not going to have to remember all your sort of GABA receptors and your dopamine neurotransmitters and which bit goes to where and but you are going to take be able to take on board how this dynamic works uh, intricately and where the sort of osteopathic dynamics can fit into that as uh, and where we find our tissue tensions as interrupters to all of this patterning and uh, reflexive feedback um, and so on.
So it's, it's how we're working um, it, it, as um, osteopaths, body workers, other sorts of um, you know manual therapists. Uh, we're working through these communicative channels. Uh, we have to learn to understand that our input uh, is not just about following this anatomy pathway. Um, um, you know, although obviously that comes into it to some degree, it's about understanding what signalling is triggered by our input. If we understand the signaling and what that we can trigger, we understand where those signals go. We understand or we hypothesize about the uh, tissue tension changing the afferent signaling and therefore changing the network possibilities and the coordinative possibilities of all these reflexes. And then the impact that that has efferently, we can then understand both what we might be able to do, but also how we might monitor on, uh, if you like, on the outcome side of things, whether we, we are doing anything or whether the infants recovering themselves or whether they, you know, uh, something else is changing in the mother infant dyad communicative uh, dialogue for example that may be bringing about uh, resolution so it might not always be what in fact we're actually doing and some of what we might be doing is actually this issue of having a settled space being a having a role as therapist as co-regulator with both infant and and uh, mum and and I've said so many times for so many years actually what you do most powerfully is is you bring you know you take hold of infant from mum and you bring infant and you look at infant and you give it that attention you're settled your respiration is different you're not the stress one that can't feed your infant you're not the one that's in agony because of that you know difficulty and so you can bring a different regulatory dynamic and as the infant changes just with your focus uh, almost then mum picks that up and then you, you see mum sort of you know changing and then uh, you're you can then start a dialogue or continue your dialogue of course with mum and so on and it brings this co-regulatory dynamic because when everybody sort of in this other new thing you can then help to bring mum and baby back in now in a new novel internal environment for the both of them which is then mutually uh, more beneficial uh, to each other so they can then move forwards in regulation so actually a lot of your work uh, is actually not the hands-on it's actually this ability to provide a, a, um, a hub around which regulation between the two can then emerge and obviously all that um, is there's all sorts of things to do with um, oxytocin and say dopamine and and just you know what's happening between mother and child and so on so we can obviously look at um, all of those things and we do so these behaviorings around contact lack of contact the nature of contact and so on um, is important and we think we look at what things can add to that we look at what things can bring um, you know additional um, uh, experiencing to reinforce what should then be a, a an easy co self-regulatory co and self-regulatory dynamic so we, we look at um, infant practices for a whole load of things and we look at this issues of um, you know uh, bonding and initial recover and we of course you know don't forget mum mum is so critical you know when the baby is brought in and said help I can't feed my baby and everybody goes to the baby and tries to work out what's wrong with the baby and the baby may be fine but the baby not may not be having the experiencing and reinforcements and responses to its behaviorings that it, it, it um, inherently needs and it's because mum may not be able to offer that and she may not recognize what the cues are she may never have been guided into that she may have our, her own sort of pains and recoveries and issues um, that, that she needs support with and receptively she may have dynamics that need resolving so that she can then help co-regulate and actually sort of um, manifest in the in the feeding dynamic with her infant whether it's actually breastfeeding or whether it's bottle feeding or some other form of types of, of uh, feeding um, you know there are all sorts of, of things that which we can talk out uh, about that and so yeah we look at bits and pieces from the polyvagal perspective and now again i know some osteopaths around the globe you know have issues with the polyvagal dynamics and and um you know i'm i'm, I'm building up a, a an appreciation of what it is that's causing conflict between those whom are very in favour and those whom aren't and you know where people are coming from and where's the overlap so we sort of begin to touch on that but um What's certain, though, is that the affective domain is then so um, uh, set up by having um, good attachment, uh, good co-regulation and so on in these first few weeks and a couple of months before the infant then manifests the ability to be much more self-regulatory. So this whole dynamic of building up the right side of the brain, uh, getting the 
autonomic stability um, in place, getting the limbic balancing around that um, right brain functioning and, and communication is really important because if it doesn't occur, um, and you could argue that in fact, a lot of the ventral vagal um, myelination doesn't actually come in for several months. And so you can't get that social perspective down through your nucleus ambiguous into the heart brain link fully functional until some months after birth. Um, and so what's actually going on in the first few hours and days isn't isn't socially driven it's physiologically and metabolically driven and um, for survival needs of the infant but obviously those issues have have powerful impacts both onto the brain of the child and the brain of the mother such that they can eventually build this efficient social network we, we talk about those sorts of things but it, it is a big story but we also talk on about so all of this trigeminal innovation all of this vagal innovation, all of this conversion, facial um, nerve uh, dynamics, the hypoglossal and so on. We understand then the appreciation that um, pain and nociception or pain perception and nociception can come along uh, into this. We have um, neuroception, this autonomic interoceptive dynamic, which will come, come along. So we have to understand when the infant's in pain, when it's autonomically aroused, you know, where is going to be the generator for the unsettledness and this distress, which manifests into all sorts of changing behaviour. Uh, in our central pattern generations and our metabolic control um, with our suck swallow breathe therefore meaning that the infant isn't getting it together and if the infant isn't getting it together then that gives all sorts of problems back out to mum uh, and so it's important that we that we appreciate um you know how um dynamics are going on and, and we sort of can we're able to throw in a whole host of things about for example facial mimicry um and how it may in fact not be a, an, an emotional dynamic but this facial mimicry that they do as tiny babies is actually setting up the rest of their pharyngeal and uh, esophageal and and other muscles for a uh, later chewing for different types of swallowing with with food and so in fact it may not be um, the the um, uh, the sort of emotional sort of uh, um, construct that's that's being built it may be a physicality uh, one so we look at that we talk about mirror neurons we talk about how these things are built up we talk about all sorts of layerings of of um, complex interactions and so when you begin to understand the infant um, in this way and we haven't even talked about latch yet have we and we haven't even talked about nipple pain and all the rest of it um, you understand that there are so, these multimodal dynamics at play with this within the infant and the mum and so in fact your work can be on all sorts of different levels and so I absolutely want you to be able to understand how you look at this in the round how you look at the whole story um, and you may want to work here you may want to work there you may know that this needs doing but you may not be the person to do it and so you know how your personal range of experiencings and competencies uh, can then be able to be expressed <clears throat> such that the mother and the infant get the care that they uh, need. So if you don't appreciate the round, you don't know um, where your limitations may be. You don't know where, in fact, your expertise may lay and what your contribution is. Others, if it's above others. And so it's really important that you, you are able to frame, um, you know, this, this um, uh, uh, clinical um, analysis in, in these in these in-depth ways. Obviously, emotions do come into it, and, and with this, this is an emotional regulation as well as autonomic and metabolic regulation, as well as neural arousal regulatory uh, dynamics and communicative um, regulation. So, and obviously, if, if things don't go right in these um, early stages, they can have lifelong consequences. So, we do obviously set up all sorts of issues about attachment um, theories and, um, and, and so on, and, and because the long term impacts on, on managing arousals, managing things for neurodevelopment developmental dynamics for, for the integration of reflexes for the ongoing ability for you know sight focus hearing uh, you know uh, alertnesses and le alertness for focus for learning for memory all of these things can be really um, uh, impacted so when we look at the head and, and you know feeling all these torsions we, we certainly you know revisit now then the anatomy of the condyles the torsions the ovale for all the nerves where are the nerves going you know where are they how are they getting impinged um, and we look at all of that but also in the fluids and we look at um, the dynamics of how um, the venous system is actually different with um, infants um, and we look at the um, you know issues of um, you know my personal view is primary respiration as, uh, respiration as a fluidic and autonomic 
model, which is sort of like a, a biological event, not so much as a spiritual one. And others may have their own interpretations of that sort of thing. Um, but we look at combinations of breathing and blood flow and so on, which is to do with the balancing of, of how, um, you know, sort of brain functionality goes. So we do touch on that a bit. Um, but uh, again, you know, I've, I've got another separate, if you like, voluntary cranial course, if I can have such a terrible pun on things, as opposed to an involuntary cranial course, um, if I can have my voluntary cranial course and the issues of intraosseous stress, periosteal innovation, how do you unwind bones from a non-IVM perspective, you know, how do you uh, do something that's not uh, craniosacral, so to speak, um, and still have an effect, you know, I've, I've got a whole other course coming on that, but you don't need to, uh, um, you don't have to have one modality or another, Nothing is mutually exclusive. You don't have to do uh, involuntary mechanism indirect stuff with infants. But if you do do other forms of care, you need to know where the physical limits are. You need to know the um, uh, you know, possible uh, ad adaptations to both pressure, uh, range um, uh, and the impact that you're then having. So we, we do obviously talk a bit about that. And we talk about all sorts of things to do with, you know, uh, heads and we talk about, you know, head shapes, torsions, and obviously we, you know, cover all of that suture stuff and the, and the membranes within. But we talk about airflow and we talk about nasal airflow because obviously, you know, infants have to breathe through their nose. So if they've got issues here, that's really important. We look at that posterior pharyngeal space. We look at this um, dynamics of airflow as well in sleep and so on. We look at the apneic dynamics and how if you have poor tone in your airway dilators that impacts on the ability of that same anatomy to then work well within the suck swallow breathe pharyngeal constrictor models for the swallow mechanics uh, so we look at sort of noses we look at palates uh, we look at tongue pressuring so we look at vacuum um, and we look at oh, eyes you know it's so important that the infant can sort of focus on its mum get that fixity and you actually just say oh no where are ah there I am mum you know and sort of beam into mum so that mum's going oh I'm being beamed into um, and so you've got to be able to use your eyes you have to have all sorts of good vestibular ocular dynamics you have to have postural control you have to have neck muscle control um, and anything which brings a symmetry into your tone whether it's problems with tone between the back and the front or the left and the right all of these things and become um, really um, important so we look at functionality of the face we look at working in the face we look at getting you off the cranial base and into the face, the pharynx, the visceral tubes, the ventral fascias. We look at these other things without forgetting the bones, of course. And we uh, look at how motor input to motor usages brings um, and contributes to um, torsionality, stresses, changes of shapes. We talk about the impact of um, early uh, plagiocephalies. We look at sternocleidomastoid and torticollises uh, being issues of vestibular asymmetry and reflex uh, poor integration from a fetal intrauterine perspective. Um, and we look at how these things are then important, but we also um, have some comments about the fact that the the way that you have head turn preferencing is set up by other sensory um, events so you are already asymmetric in your ability to look listen and engage with the maternal dynamic which presets up torsions which then distorts your brain case and distorts those bones such that osteopathically you then feel um, manifestations of torsion patterns throughout your your sbs and other brain areas condylar stress strain and torsions which emerge as a result of this neurosensory asymmetry and the um the the impetus it gives to the infant to volitionally or even have to have the tone to engage one way more than the other. So we talk all about all sorts of things and we also talk about all sorts of neural entrapments and we remind you that it's not all vagal, we remind you that it's not all trigeminal. We bring in simple things, not only of course the hypoglossal nerve and where that goes through with respect to the um, condyles and foramen magnum, <laughs> we remind you about the spinal accessory which goes through this foramen magnum and this torsionality of your SBS um, should direct you to spinal accessory and things like this because these are the head turn dynamics which are really critical for being able to sort of find one breast um, poorly and the other much more efficiency because you have different abilities to experience um, through here. So we talk about all sorts of things like that. And as I say, we talk about all sorts of things then, you know, when we get down to the to the to the uh, 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 the anatomy of function of the suck and the breast action and so on, and we talk right, what's the maternal side of things? So on, if you're on the boob side of the nipple, 
or you're on the baby side of the nipple, you know, what's going on within each of you, which you need to work out. So then we obviously we go through bits of latch and I've got lots of references and things that you can sort of look at with respect to what's a good latch, what's a poor latch, you know, um, how, how should the nipple be placed and so on. So you can have these awarenesses. And so there are obviously things which lactation consultants um, will be educating the mother infant dyad uh, on. Um, there are other people in the mix, such as breastfeeding support people, uh, midwives and so on and all have a contribution to this understanding so even if you're not directing this aspect of care um, then you can be observatory of what's going on you need to have that knowledge and uh, obviously as some people then get extremely experienced they can have uh, a view through their um, uh, in situ you know ex observatory experiences of when things just aren't happening right and there's a potential for making suggestions and that I think it's in this overlap of roles that um, a it can be really interesting but B, it requires the greatest clarification as to, well, on what are you basing that then? Because, you know, are you going on hearsay experience of other osteopaths? Or are you going on your own embedded experience? And is your experience from in clinic, in vivo dynamics um, mostly, or have you had uh, training and other things? How much training should you need, by the way? Should everybody have to do the full um, uh, board certification for the lactation consultancy? Or is there some sort of inner, you know, slightly hybrid thing that can come about? These are all things that I think as a profession we, we need to tackle. We can't just, you know, drift on, um, uh, you know, without um, uh, analysing this, because it's not about stopping one's practice. It's actually about enhancing practice based on interprofessional dialoguing, role clarifications, and what's understanding the competence required to perform those roles so that people can have safety and security uh, all around. So, we, you know, we obviously give some indications about, you know, what is going on with latch and swallow and so on, so that you have this understanding awareness. Um, but we also talk a lot about mum, her anatomy, the breast anatomy, the innovation, the lymphatics, you know, how you work with circulation, thoracic inlets, clavicles, the costal cartilages, how you do breast dynamics, how you work with nipple unwinding and doing all sorts of things, which is really useful in support of the lactating breast. And we go through what goes on in lactation and we go through nipple pain and, and nipple, um, uh, you know, muscular um, dynamics. And so we, we talk about a whole variety of things and then obviously back out into mum's head um, and, and her functionality and her epidural effects and her all sorts of, you know, whatever might be going on with her, as well as what's then going on within the body. So we get the two heads together with the two sides of the breast and we get the whole thing working in a reciprocal co-regulatory uh, dynamic, uh, hopefully. And we work in support of that aim. And then obviously we get into things like... Um, Absolutely. What should the tongue be doing? How do we examine the tongue? You know, what are we going to be uh, looking for? Um, how are we going to be um, fitting in with that? So we need to understand the tongue. We need to understand the pharyngeal arches and we need to have I've got all sorts of theories about, you know, torticollis as a pharyngeal arch disorder. And, you know, goodness only knows. Um, but it, we have to understand the embryology of the tongue. And we have to understand what are all the range of reflexes. Here are just a few. You know, what nerves contribute to all of these things? How, how do these things not go right? So what is the difference phase? is a swallow so which cranial nerves are involved in all of the different aspects so when you look at how the um, uh, you know different colored patterns are here in these pictures go to different uh, muscles um, and uh, different sensory experiences so that you use an enormous number of cranial nerves at least half of them simply to swallow um, uh, so it's an incredible uh, dynamic to understand uh, the, the diversity of the aerodigestive um, tube um, and, and how this anatomy has to be coordinated. So it's, it's not surprising that it goes wrong sometimes. And uh, this, this is just um, a, 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 a uh, a little imagery from um, sort of you know uh, fetal dissections but it's the way that your pharyngeal pouches um, work how they migrate how they fold how they're interconnected and how you have the pharynx and all of its little uh, pouches and glands we have um, you know limb buds lung buds we have thyroids emerging here's our lungs down here and we have different sort of parathyroid glands as well as that whole pharyngeal esophageal dynamic coming in and, and it all blends in together and it's such a fascinating um, emergence of functionality. So we, we sort of go, go through a bit of that and then we talk about the 
dynamics of how their infant throat is different with the placement of the epiglottis and the relative size and positionings. We talk about the, you know, the, the oral side of the um, soft palate and then the nasal side of the soft palate and then the shared um, uh, oropharynx um, in this section and, and how then this um, epiglottal root of the tongue is functioning. So we talk about then obviously this builds up an understanding of um, tongue tie dynamics, but it also brings into this understanding of all of this anatomy through here that, you know, it, it's not enough just to think, oh, it's a tongue tie, we'll snip it and it'll be better. Uh, because in fact, there's this all of this anatomy which then has to come into play. So tie or no tie, snip or no snip, um, you know, it's actually how does this anatomy all work? So even if you have a tie, how is that changing things? And when you have a snip, well, how do you then get the person or the baby to then think, oh, now I can do my tongue differently? You know, half the babies have got no experience of that. So they don't know how to guide their muscles now in a new novel pattern because you know some weeks after birth they're losing this brainstem reflexogenity to bring them into this appropriate sac solo breathe because into a good pattern because they've been experiencing the bad pattern which has become imprinted and so in fact the brain has got no concept of any other pattern doesn't know another pattern could now exist because it's missed that window and it has to be shown a new pattern is possible which can only be done by different sensory experiencing because the baby isn't providing that sensory experiencing for itself by not using its mouth, tongue and muscles now in a new way, even though they've been released. So some babies get the point very quickly. They, they've been, you know, gagging for it almost, if I can use that terrible pun. And they've been sort of waiting for that moment and then they're off. I mean, it's fabulous and it releases the nipple pain and trauma and all sorts. But other babies need a significant amount of help to understand the complexities of their anatomy, the possibilities within. And once you start then reintegrating things, they've had to, of course, had a, they've had been having a different suck, swallow, breathe. So their breathing respiratory regulator and central pattern generators now need to reemerge. Their peristaltic gastrointestinal um, uh, enteric uh, reflex peristaltic dynamics, that patterning has to change. So everything has to grind into a new modality. So uh, the issues of sleep, arousal and so on all now come back into, into play. So um, understanding um, these dynamics, understanding you know where the tongue should go, can it go, does it now go, what can you do in support of that? Um, you know, how, how do you help all of that is really important and you know how do you get to the hypoglossal nerve, how do you get to the fat of this zone and how do you get into all these other nerves like the trigeminal and the facial and as I say how you understand this convergence and if you impact trigeminally it improves vagus and, and, and so on so you don't have to drive it only through the vagus. Um, as I say we talk a lot about how other aspects and that you can begin to improve restoration of good function by changing the interceptive feedback from other areas such as the diaphragm such as the crura such as the stomach and the, uh, the cardiac sphincter of the stomach and the pyloric sphincter and then within the lungs the mechanoreceptors within the lungs the pulmonary ligaments the issues behind the back of the heart, the aortic fascia, all of these um, dynamics. And we suddenly then realise that we've got uh, an enormous uh, range of things that we can contribute in this dynamic as a whole. And, you know, a few years ago now, I did this sort of big um, study in New Zealand where um, with the um, uh, uh, Osteopathic Council of New Zealand support and as part of a master's of, of uh, education, I was doing it. And when I was um, down in New Zealand, uh, we surveyed all of the profession about whether they did um, paediatric care, what sort of paediatric care they did. And we got an enormous number of um, uh, intervention uh, reports uh, back, um, you know, diagnostic ideas, conceptual framework, commentaries, um, and, you know, presenting types of symptoms as patient reported, and then osteopathic, you know, annotated. Um, so uh, it, it, these are the words in lived in practice, um, as opposed to an artificial, you know, definition of, you know, stuff that everybody's had to agree, which is never going to happen. Um, but um, we surveyed up to I think about 759 individual patient encounters as to what was done, what was the presentation, what was the age of the child, um, the sex of the child and so on. And so we were able to see clusters because they could report all sorts of their symptoms, not just one. So we then could cluster and look at how, what was the, you know, if people had as their main primary complaint feeding difficulties, what else clustered around it? If we looked at people that had plagiocephaly as their main presenting symptom, in what way did symptoms cluster around that? And in those scenarios, what was done? What was different? And what was really interesting was that there was um, uh, not this direct line which said, 
If there's a tongue tie, the osteopath does this. Uh, if there's plagiocephaly, the osteopath does that. If there's plagiocephaly with a bit of colic, then the osteopath does this. So there's none of that clarity and you think, oh my God, then it's a ridiculous profession that we're in because there's no logic, there's no meaning, therefore there can't be scientific rationale and how do you research all of this implausibility? Because there's, you know, there's, there's seemingly no linkages between, even in the same group of people with a commonality of feeding presentations of same age and same gender, then the osteopaths are doing all sorts of other things. And actually, when you unpick that, um, and I, I've got a million papers I'm supposed to be writing on all of this, but when you unpick that, what you realise is going on is that through our exploration of the person, we have taken on board all of these collective universal combinations of issues through sleep patterning, the anatomy of the pharynx, the dynamics of the uh, esophagus, the issues of the jaw function, the ability of the eyes to focus and the head to balance and the postural intention, and therefore the level of arousal within the infant and the arousal within the mum and the um, uh, abilities of their daily patternings and their circadian rhythms to come into place with a suck, swallow, breathe, to be supported by a nicely coordinated central pattern generator to, um, with, and allowing all these primitive reflexes to, um, to, to integrate, reducing pain, birth, stress and trauma, um, and bringing in this ability of the infant to understand itself, and therefore its self, uh, to, to become um, settled and uh, feel safe and supported, um, and therefore being able to build up a whole host of things. So this essentially is the essence of what I'm trying to do with the, the course and then when you take on board that you're going to realize why each individual osteopath is going to have a different approach and it's not the fact that then the osteopaths don't know all the right things and that they should be doing all the same things evidently they couldn't ever be expected to do the same things because the individuality of all of this um, neural and anatomical and physiological interdependency is particularly unique to that infant and to that infant mother dyad and their situation, their circumstances, their trials, stresses, traumas, and, and, and barriers to good function. So you have to have a uniquely applied um, dynamic. But that doesn't mean to say it can't be explained, and you can't explain then differences in osteopathic approaches, but you can do so through an end of this scientific understanding. And in fact, it makes it so much easier. It's so much easier when you have a bit of this underlying knowledge because then you can communicate. Well, I think I'm doing this because I think it's affecting this aspect. And I think I'm doing this because I think it's affecting this aspect. And this is where I'm hoping to contribute with this. And so we can actually bring a justification and a clarification into what um, our contribution is all about. So obviously we can then begin to look at, well, how are we me measuring this, monitoring this? We can look at you know various different sorts of latch scores and we can look at the... Um, lingua infernal scores I can't speak myself now tongue's gone stiff um, and we we can understand then that the key to our work is, is um, uh, being able to both observe and to appreciate but also interact with and then monitoring so the monitoring is 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 the perhaps thing that we're least efficient at so we do go through um some outcome measures you know how are other people measuring things what is it that they're measuring are those tools in any way relevant to what it is that we would like to measure in our own clinics and this is a body of work which i've been trying to get off the ground albeit very slowly with my sort of somatic project and my infant breastfeeding projects through my uh, um international little society of osteopaths i've been trying to sort of emerge and, and build up but we're looking at how we explore what osteopaths are, are imagining is changing and what then would we like to capture in terms of outcome measures because what our outcome measures are relevant for other professions are, aren't necessarily always going to capture what it is that we feel that we're contributing and so some may be relevant we may have to measure things in those same terms so that there's some uh, cross-referencing but there may be other new novel things that need to be acknowledged if you like in the therapeutic encounter that osteopaths are providing which isn't currently captured um, and so we we can have little talks about that and that's what sort of drives me in in all sorts of fields of care for osteopathy is about how we how we articulate this <laughs> many puns in that word how we articulate this uh, you know broad, broadly so yes, we can talk about some sort of techniques and things, and I, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to give you know masses and masses of technique videos and things because, in fact, what I prefer to do is to, um, you know, use my qualifications frameworks with the CNMO to do a lot of that sort of hands-on thing. But you know, obviously, we do give some uh, guidance and some pointers and. 
point also is that many of you have all sorts of technical expertise. If you have an understanding of the anatomy, the biology, the physiology, the regulatory feedbacks and the neural networking dynamics, quite frankly, you can invent your own techniques, which are always the best ones to, to use anyway, because they are the best fit for your hands, your anatomy, your tactile experiencing and your, your understanding. So your, you have to be able to have a three dimensional understanding of where to put your hands three-dimensional understanding of if you put your hands in that place, what it is that you may or may not be able to access. And then in accessing that, you have to then take on board uh, all of the um, you know, ability of the infant to respond. Has it got the neural networks yet to actually make use of what you're doing? Or in fact, are you three months too early in trying to get a response out of them? Uh, are what you are doing placing a demand like for example over the chest with the diaphragm into the respiratory system are you overloading their respiratory control pattern generator and are you causing distress you know at what point is enough too much or you know what happens when they cry are they in pain hmm, actually no they but they may be destabilized is the uh, cry always a bad thing when you treat something which is set into a pattern and you then adjust that pattern, um, you are calling on the infant to re-regularize itself, to re-regulate all of these biological oscillations around that new um, sensory circumstance. So you are creating a tiny bit of destabilization. And so they are going to be somewhat minutely or temporarily dysregulated. And that can be uh, showing you that you've done or found the right spot or done a good thing. But obviously what you don't want to do is with fragile infants is to go over the top do too much and then completely dysregulate them because that has serious consequences uh, for for their um, morbidity etc so the the actual technicalities of in practice doing things are quite challenging um and so you know uh, th th there is a need for sort of you know um, some sort of clinical oversight but i think at, at this um uh, dynamic when one's trying to consider working within this field, uh, having a course which is going to provide you with all of these awarenesses um, and to then decide how it is that you can move forward so, you know, safely and reasonably, uh, then this, this is the, the overall aim of the, the programme. So uh, as we continue to hypothesise about what might be going on as we begin to um, contextualise anatomical dynamics, hand placements and so on, um, we can begin to um, theorise about what it is that we're really supposed to be interacting uh, with uh, and then understand if there could be risks associated with that, you know, big, large, little, negligent, you know, how do we then put across that in terms of informed consent, how do we communicate that and how do we then move forwards in a, in a, in a competent professional manner. So that's the end of my introduction. I hope I've given you some, some uh, information there already anyway that you can just take away. But if you want to get into the course, uh, then go back to the Osseo Bite Size uh, Dynamics, have a little bit of a look and a browse and um, uh, you know see where you get to. But there is an enormous amount of information for there. You have long term access to this. You can come back to it as many times as you like ongoingly. So you don't have to do it in a short time frame. You're not, you know, you don't have to rush through it in a month's worth of subscribed access. You can just, you know, take your time. If, once you've bought it, it's yours. That's, uh, you know, and in that sense, you know, the knowledge is there for you to make of that into your practice and, uh, and professional arena uh, as, as you judge fit. Enjoy. Thank you.